Welcome to DidCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. I just finished writing my dean's letter for Circa, which is one of our publications of the Divinity School, and I made as the focus of it the, the bookshelf, both the bookshelf that's on the other side of the kitchen, um, that's the center of, um, I called it the hearth of the Divinity School, and behind that hearth of the Divinity School is a room that actually has a hearth, but, but no logs or no fire in it. Um, but both of those bookshelves, together with the virtual bookshelf, which is now on our website, um, signaled the core of scholarship <coughs> um, that is the University of Chicago Divinity School. And scholarship is not just a one-off. Scholarship doesn't just go out into the world and, and sit in isolation, and it certainly doesn't take place in isolation in Swift Hall. And so one of our institutionalized ways, uh, um, cultural forms for engaging with scholarship is the Dean's Forum, which has as a subject a recent faculty book um, uh, and respondents um, sometimes um, closer and sometimes further away in discipline and subject matter specificity uh, from the book at hand. Um, the conversation about religion requires that kind of cross-disciplinary um, engagement. Um, so I'm delighted uh, that uh, Professor Kristen <coughs> Wedemeyer has um, allowed us to make his book, Making Sense of Tantric Buddhism, History, Semiology, and Transgression in the Indian Traditions from Columbia University Press 2012, the subject of this Dean's Forum. And Christian, this is one of the <laughs> corrected versions, this or is that one of the, one of the, the original ones? This is one of the originals, uncorrected um, cover. I'm going to introduce uh, each of our three speakers, and then I'm going to do a brief reading from the book so that you can hear the author's voice in that medium. And then uh, Professor Stackert will speak, and then Professor Zipporin. Christian K. Wedemeyer is assist, uh, Associate Professor of the History of Religions in the Divinity School and Associated Faculty in South Asian Languages and Civilizations. He holds the MA and PhD degree, uh, oh, excuse me, MA, M. Phil, and PhD degree from Columbia University. Um, in addition to the book that's our subject today, previously he authored a text critical study of one of the principal Indian works on esoteric praxis, prax, praxis, Ayurveda's lamp that integrates the practices, the gradual path of Varyana Buddhism according to the esoteric community noble tradition uh, in 2007. And he has co-edited three volumes, Tibetan Buddhist Literature and Praxis, studies in its formative period, 900 to 1400, together with uh, Wendy Doniger, who's here today, Hermeneutics, Politics, and the History of Religions, the Contested Legacy of Joachim Vach and Mircea Eliade, um, Oxford UP in 2010, and in Vimal Kirti's house, a fest shift in honor of Robert A.F. Thurman on the occasion of his 70th birthday, uh, 2013, appearing just this last year. Jeffrey Stackert is Assistant Professor of Hebrew Bible in the Divinity School. Um, he holds the MTS degree from Boston University School of Theology and PhD from Brandeis University. Uh, Professor Stackard is the author of Rewriting the Torah, Literary Revision in Deuteronomy and the Holiness Leg Legislation from J.C.B. Moore Zeebeck uh, um, in Tübingen in 2007. And he is currently completing a book manuscript entitled A Prophet Like Moses, Prophecy, Law, and Israelite Religion that will be forthcoming from Oxford University Press, as well as uh, working toward a co-authored commentary on the biblical book of Deuteronomy. Brooke Zipporin is professor of Chinese religion, philosophy, and comparative thought in the Divinity School. He holds the PhD from the University of Michigan. Professor Zipporin is the author of six published books, uh, beginning with Evil and or as the Good, Omnicentric Holism, Intersubjectivity, and Value Paradox in Tiantai Buddhist Thought, Harvard 2000. And then I'm going to run down to the most recent, Beyond Oneness and Difference, Li and Coherence in Chinese Buddhist Thought and Its Antecedents, which appeared in 2013 from SUNY Press. Um, the book before us, Professor Wedemeyer's book, um, I was rereading in the preface again, or in the introduction, in preparation for today, and was struck uh, yet again with how 
cogently, elegantly, and carefully written um, the book is. Um, it is laid out as both a substantive contribution to the study of, um, of the, the tantric Buddhist practices and uh, methodological intervention into the history of religions. Um, just a few uh, uh, paragraphs from our author, and then you get to hear uh, um, Viva Vox, uh, uh, Viva Voce for the author. In interpreting tantric traditions, modern scholars have put forward a number of such conceptualizations. The form of these reconstructions have generally taken, have generally taken, is an attempt to discern the origins and or to construct a narrative of tantric Buddhism that situates it within an historical process. All of the solutions offered, however, have one crucial feature in common. They all concur that ultimately transgression in Indian esoteric Buddhism does not, in fact, make sense. They do so by locating antinomian practices and discourses historically in social contexts where they appear as expressions of either animal impulses, primitive mentality superstition, or merely slavish imitation. That is, tantric um, transgression is ascribed to irrational or a-rational impulses for which further explanation is neither necessary nor possible. Such an adjudication thus serves to absolve scholars of the responsibility to confront the difficult challenges of cultural interpretation. Once it has been made, interrogation ceases. Mitra's quandary is resolved by a half measure, not the ravings of madmen perhaps, but in the end those of the ignorant, the semi-civilized, or the mimic ape. The double entendre of the title, of, I just ellipsed a page and a half, of making sense of tantric Buddhism um, the double entendre reflects what might be called the book's implicit methodological, or after Collingwood's usage, philosophical project. An approach that, quote, never simply thinks about an object, but, quote, always while thinking about any object, thinks also about its own thought about that object. The aim is to consider not merely the object itself, Indian tantric Buddhism, or solely the theoretical frameworks by which scholars come to understand it, but to grapple from these two in their mutual relation. By so doing, the goal is to make both a critical intervention into scholarly method and a constructive contribution to the interpretation of its object. <laughs> Professor Wedemeyer's book has already been recognized um, last month or last uh, November. It received from the American Academy of Religion the 2012 award for excellence in the study, or 2013 award for the 2012 book um, for excellence in the study of religion, historical studies. I have a picture of the award ceremony on my phone, should anyone like to see it uh, <laughs> later. Um, but it's nice on our own home turf to recognize Professor Wedemeyer for this marvelous book and to engage in conversation on it. So I ask for a round of applause for Professor Wedemeyer and call him. <laughs> Thank you, thank you uh, all for being here, and thank you, Dean Mitchell, for inviting me, and to my esteemed colleagues for responding. I've been asked to say a few words about the book, um, though I think I, I mean, I should, and I think I will try to keep it short. Uh, I've just been handed a 10-minute uh, uh, lecture that uh, Professor Stackert has written out, so I, I need to leave room for that. Um, <coughs> uh, I was reminded uh, this morning when I woke up and realized that I had to come to this thing of a <laughs> anec anecdote that happened right at the very outset of the work that began uh, and uh, resulted in this uh, volume. I uh, was a graduate student at Columbia and I, by a strange series of circumstances, had ended up being in the position of writing a dissertation or thinking about writing a dissertation on uh, esoteric or tantric Buddhism not a subject that I went to graduate school to study and uh, one that I had sort of fallen into accidentally by a number of uh, uh, strange circumstances. Um, but it did turn out that the professor who had retired uh, from the uh, position uh, that my uh, advisor had taken was still around as a professor emeritus and uh, I would run into him on the streets uh, in front of Ollie's and so on. And so it occurred to me, uh, you know, I should talk to him because he actually had written about this subject matter. So I, I went up to uh, Professor Wayman on the street and I said, you know, Professor Wayman, I'm so and so and, and I want to talk to you. I'm, I'm thinking about doing this dissertation on the Guhya Samaja Tantra. And do you have a minute that we could sit down and talk about sources and, and some methods and so on? And he said, oh, Guhya Samaja. 
I wrote a book about that. <laughs> I said, yes, Professor Wayman, thank you very much. I know that. That's kind of why I'm talking to you right now. Uh, could we meet and you know maybe talk about it, since I don't know really very much about this subject matter at all? He said, oh, well, read the book. I, I, it's whatever I know. It's in the book. <laughs> And I thought to myself, wow, this man is stark raving mad. Uh, he's written a book about this subject matter, and uh, he um, doesn't remember what's in the book. And this was my opinion until about 2008, when my first book had been out for a year, and I couldn't remember a thing that I had written in it. And I had a lot more compassion for Alex Wayman, who had written this book some 15 or 20 years before I had had this conversation with him. So um, even though it's only been out a few uh, uh, months or year, a year or so, I, I'm a little bit rusty on the whole thing. Uh, so hopefully uh, uh, Jeff and, and Brooke will re re refresh my memory. Um, so I ended up in this, in this area uh, which a lot of people like to call understudied, and this is a wonderful thing because if you read uh, scholarship in probably any field, but certainly in religious studies, everybody's field is understudied. Right? That's why everyone has to study it. Um, uh, Tantra may legitimately have some claim to that, or it had some uh, back at the time. Uh, it was considered the kind of... Uh, dirty, lost stepchild of Buddhist studies, uh, the, the part that wasn't really Buddhism anymore, people didn't really want to talk about it, uh, maybe the Hindus could be interested in it because it was kind of ritualistic, um, but really it was just off the deep end. I mean, and so, so you, in some sense, what I was confronted with uh, from the very start in trying to look at this material was one of the central interpretative problems of Buddhism. And Buddhism is not, this is not unique uh, or a unique case in the study of Buddhism. Um, I was reminded recently uh, of a pretty vigorous debate that took place in the 1860s, 1870s about another aspect of the Buddhist tradition. Um, and this was whether Buddhists could really believe that there was no self and there was no God. And there was a certain camp that argued, of course that's what they believe, that's what their texts say. And there was another group that said they can't possibly think that. That's contrary to everything we know about human nature, and therefore there has to be another way that we can read their rhetoric against the reality of their practices and their traditions. Um, and so what I'm, I was presented in the case of Tantrism with a very similar problem, where the texts say one thing, and in fact you had uh, people trying to resolve the cognitive dissonance set up by what the texts say. I'll just briefly read you. I, there's a kind of uh, uh, implicit stylistic allusion to Foucault's uh, Discipline and Punish in the way the book starts, um, uh, which starts with a quotation, basically from a tantric text, um, meant to illustrate the problem. And it reads like this. So this is a scriptural uh, citation from a highly revered uh, uh, Buddhist uh, revealed text. Having drunk dog, donkey, camel, and elephant blood, one should regularly feed on their flesh. Human flesh, smeared with the blood of all species of animals, is beloved. Entirely vile meat full of millions of worms is divine. Meat rendered putrid by shit, seething with hundreds of maggots, mixed with dog and human vomit, with a coating of piss. Mixed with shit, it should be eaten by the yogin with gusto. So this is the problem, right? Uh, people, this is what the texts say. And there have been people that said they could not possibly mean that. Uh, that is not uh, possible. And so in some sense there have broken down two camps of interpreters uh, up to that point. Um, those who, uh, like the self and God, said, no, that's what the books say. The books say eat shit, that's what they did, and that's what they're supposed to do, and if they don't do it, then they're not doing it right. Uh, that's what tantric Buddhism is. Uh, and there's another group that similarly, uh, I mean, and for various reasons, made arguments that often came from human nature, like the arguments about self and God, to saying that it couldn't happen. Um, and so this is where I went originally, and I was, I was looking at the history of scholarship, uh, as uh, is often my want to try to figure out where other people had been with it. And I found that people spent a lot of time writing semi-imaginative histories of this literature to try to put it within an understandable story where they could make sense of why anyone would say all these outrageous things. 
Um, and I found there was a variety of things. So what uh, uh, the dean alluded to it in, in what she read. One is that it, which was the old original uh, story, that it's degenerate, right? You had a nice Buddhism. Buddhism was good. It was moral. It was upstanding, meditative. And then they got all weird, right? The Buddha said you can't have sex, you can't drink, you can't do all this stuff, and that was not very nice, right? So they decided they would find some way where they could have sex and you know have booze and so on. Uh, I did, yeah, what I the quote I gave you is. is uh, there's other things, right, where it says eat, eat meat and drink alcohol and so on, things that people find less objectionable than, than the other part. But, um, uh, so, um, but this is really a, a, an argument about human nature, right? People want to enjoy themselves. They have natural desires, and therefore, tantrism must uh, have been an attempt for people to uh, incorporate their desires within the Buddhist tradition. Uh, there was another set of, of imaginative histories that basically said this is the, the most primitive uh, religious substratum of the entire world, right? This is the pre-Aryan, autochthonous, uh, uh, matriarchal tradition, uh, sometimes associated with tribal uh, traditions, uncivilized traditions. And um, so, you know, they're kind of weird and magical, right? They're not, uh, you know, light-skinned Aryan types coming down from Central Asia. They're matriarchal, right? We know about women and the body and all that stuff, right? So you can kind of understand, right, these weird tribals with their, you know, strange matriarchy, right, that they would do these kinds of weird things. Another argument from human nature. And then uh, another category, which is really hot right now, uh, put it somewhere in the middle, right? So it's not a decline at the end. It's not a you know, primordially bubbling uh, Ur tradition of, of, uh, of you know, pre-civilization, but it's a medieval practice. Uh, and uh, this brings in all of the other associations that we have with Catholics and ritual and mindless behavior and so on. And so really, basically, they're <laughs> another argument from human nature, right? They're just kind of mindless folks like those weird Catholics that live down the, down the road. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so this is where I came from, and this is in some sense, you know, uh, uh, the Mitra's quandary that, that was in the passage that the, the dean um, uh, read. Um, that question of how do we make sense of the fact that millions of otherwise sane human beings hold these scriptures as sacred and incorporate them in very expensive, very elaborate uh, social and institutional structures. Um, so I am probably out of good time, uh, so, and, and there's, uh, I, uh, I'll leave kind of uh, treating the arguments to the, the respondents, but this led me then into uh, the, really the core of the book, which is a semiotical study of what these statements mean in the context of the scriptures themselves, and um, a look at um, the uh, occurrence of transgressive practices, transgressive uh, uh, statements within a really broad range of scriptures. Um, so this is part of the, the methodological con contribution of the book at, as well, is to look en masse at uh, literatures, to look at the structures of uh, signification across not just, uh, across, so not just look at one text in isolation, right, but to look at how language is used, how practices are uh, recommended, uh, across the, as much of the literature as possible to get a sense uh, of the whole tradition and its rhythms and how these practices are situated. Um, and so I end up, I mean, just in brief, coming down somewhere in the middle. Uh, uh, it's not the case that these were absolutely literally done and all, you know, uh, that it's just what the book says. Um, because, of course, the book just doesn't say anything. We bring a lot to what we read in the text, and even our literal readings brings our own presuppositions to bear. It's also not the case that they never ever did them, and that this was just something completely symbolic, and, and you know, vomit and feces are just uh, symbols for compassion and love and, and transcendent bliss, right? Um, there's, uh, like most things that human beings do, it's somewhere in the middle. We, we live in the symbolic order all the time, right? Everything we do is meaningful. Everything that we encounter is saturated with meaning. And what you find in the tantric texts are systems of meaning which, through which they saturate their worlds. Um, and uh, among those worlds of meaning, the idea of virtuoso practitioners who are beyond good and evil, who can do things like uh, have you know, a lovely uh, Wednesday lunch in one plate and a pile of feces and vomit in another plate and eat them with equal gusto and perceive that in fact the divine purity of existence is in both of them is part of their informing uh, religious worldview. 
Um, how they enacted that is a somewhat more complex story that I don't have time for, so I will leave it there, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Let me just say it was fantastic watching your faces while Christian was reading. Uh, That's why we have this after lunch. Exactly. <laughs> Let me begin by congratulating, uh, congratulating Christian Wedemeyer on what I can only describe as a masterful work, Making Sense of Tantric Buddhism, History, Semiology, and Transgression in the Indian Traditions. It has been a rare occasion when I have enjoyed reading a book so much or learned so much from the experience. I would also like to thank Dean uh, Margaret Mitchell for inviting me to respond to Professor Wedemeyer's book in this Dean's Forum and thereby giving me the opportunity to engage and interact with this very interesting and important study. I would guess that almost no one has ever wondered, and with good reason, what a scholar of the Hebrew Bible and ancient Near Eastern religion and culture such as myself has to say in response to a book such as Christian Wedemeyer's Making Sense of Tantric Buddhism. I am certainly no scholar of Buddhism generally or tantric traditions in particular, and even if one were to admit the possibility of a biblical scholar having interest in such a topic, how would it be that a biblicist could understand a subject so complicated and fraught as tantric Buddhism? The answer in this case is quite simple. Professor Wedemeyer has written a book that is as understandable as it is compelling, even to those whose expertise is far removed from his own. I should also note that making sense of tantric Buddhism is even funny, a rare feat for the academic monograph, <laughs> at least in my experience. Uh, this book includes, for example, pop culture references as varied as the Beverly Hillbillies, Luke Skywalker and the Jedi Council, Freud's famous cigar, and television commercials for Cross Your Heart Bras that surprisingly uh, have the ability to convince young boys to ask for the same for Christmas. One wonders whether there is a smidge of autobiography in this last <laughs> one. <laughs> Maybe we even hope for it. <laughs> Jay-Z Smith has argued, rightly in my view, that scholars of religion generally have two subjects of inquiry, two orders of investigation. One is aimed at the particular set of texts, traditions, practices, and phenomena that they are investigating. The other engages the history of their subdisciplines, investigations of such texts, traditions, practices, and phenomena, and the ideological and philosophical issues at play in that history of scholarship. Christian Wedemeyer has offered in his book a model of such dual inquiry. Let me briefly summarize the work, although you've already heard some of this. Making sense of tantric Buddhism comprises two parts, each one corresponding with one half of the double entendre of the title. The first part of the book addresses the question of how Tantric Buddhism has been explained, how people have made sense of it, first in the history of scholarship on Buddhism and second within the Buddhist tradition itself. Drawing especially on Hayden White's arguments regarding narrative form, Wedemeyer shows that in both cases there is a limited stock of conventional stories told concerning the place of Tantrism in the history of Buddhism and that these stereotyped accounts encode particular valuations of Tantrism. In the case of modern scholarship, these valuations have oftentimes been negative and orientalist. The second part of the book is then a synchronic reading of Buddhist tantrism, how Professor Wedemeyer himself makes sense of it. Employing a semiotic approach, and in particular connotative semiotics, Wedemeyer shows that the transgressive antisocial acts of tantrism, the eating of taboo meats, the consumption of feces, urine, wine, blood, semen, and marrow, as well as a variety of illicit practices, including sexual yogas, funereal dress, and frequenting impure places, are specific inversions of exoteric Buddhist ideals. As such, they signal a transcendence of the dualities of exoteric Buddhism, particularly in relation to purity and pollution. These practices, however, Wedemeyer suggests were very limited. They were virtuoso performances by a professionalized elite, though not limited to monks, and not the purview of the wider, the wider Buddhist masses. Wedemeyer also shows quite convincingly that tantrism was part of the heart of Buddhist practice and discourse in the late first millennium and not peripheral to it, as is oftentimes claimed. Its practitioners were highly esteemed and learned fig figures within exoteric dualist Buddhism, and in their esoteric discourse and practice worked to the same ends as the exoteric discourse and practice they inverted. 
That is, their aim was the protection and benefit of the community, not its destabilization. To the extent that their practices were transgressive or rebellious attempts to transcend the tradition, they were so from within it. The atypical nature of tantric practitioners mirrored the exceptional social position they inhabited. By being identifiably exceptional, they reinforced the norm. As Wedemeyer puts it, their liminality was contrived. What Wedemeyer achieves in the end is a new explanation of esoteric Buddhism in the late first millennium that situates its practice broadly within the wider Indian milieu of which it was a part, both in relation to exoteric Buddhism and other forms of tantrism. In this new account, Wedemeyer domesticates tantrism, but not as some orientalist accounts have, namely as an exotic aboriginal practice later tamed or as a prurient indulgence of the repressed, the latter being the sort of banality of which pornography uh, partakes. Wedemeyer instead shows that in his words, tantric Buddhism was banal all along. The sensational and titillating was in Buddhism part of the mundane. In the time I have remaining, I'd like both to reflect briefly on the value that I see in making sense of tantric Buddhism for scholars outside of the field of Buddhist studies and to pose a question to Professor Wedemeyer. With regard to the wider relevance of making sense of tantric Buddhism, the first part of the book on the modern historiography of tantric Buddhism and especially its origins is instructive as an analog uh, to the history of biblical studies, for example. The early historiography of Buddhism that Wedemeyer analyzes arose both in the same time period and interacted with many of the same philological, historical, and philosophical conversation partners as biblical scholars did, particularly as they engaged in their reconstruction of the history of Israelite religion. Precisely the sort of imagined positionings of tantrism that Wedemeyer describes in Buddhist historiography as beginning, end, or middle are the options entertained by 19th and early 20th century biblical scholars in their attempts to position the priestly cult in the development of Israelite religion and with similar values attached to them. Professor Wedemeyer's demonstration of the limited options in traditional Buddhism for explaining the origins of tantrism is equally illuminating for biblical studies, for they provide a ready analog for understanding various biblical attempts to account for religious innovations and the authority ascribed to them. For example, appeals to Buddha in traditional Buddhist accounts of tantrism work in remarkably similar ways to appeals to Moses in the Torah and in early Judaism. There is thus much to be gleaned from making sense of tantric Buddhism for comparative study of scripture. I've never before assigned to my students reading for, readings from Buddhist studies. It's hard for me now to imagine not having them read making sense of tantric Buddhism. For the sake of time, I'll limit myself to a single question. In his explanation of transgression as inversion, Professor Wedemeyer quotes Bruce Lincoln's observation that, quote, an order twice inverted is an order restored, perhaps even strengthened as a result of the exercise, end quote. Lincoln offers this observation in the, in the conclusion to his incisive and memorable analysis of professional wrestling in American culture. As Lincoln describes it, the drama of wrestling moves through a dialectical progression from virtue to evil to strengthen virtue. The inversion in this drama, the villainous, might map onto Wedemeyer's tantrism. My question then is, what is the imagined response of the exoteric Buddhist masses to tantrism in your reconstruction? I don't get the sense that you understand the tantric practitioners to be for devotees to exoteric Buddhism, the ones they love to hate, as the wrestling villains in some sense are. You note that the consumption of the meats and ambrosias, as well as other esoteric practices, are meant to be emically distasteful and even abhorrent, even as you also note that tantric practices would require patronage and existed only among an elite minority. Can you say more then about what you imagine the response to their subversive practices to be? And I recognize that in asking this question, I'm pressing somewhat beyond what you intend in your book. That is, you note explicitly that you are not engaging the particularity of different tantric Buddhist communities or diachronic changes that occurred, but are instead describing something more like ideal types. Nonetheless, I'd be interested to hear what else you could say about this. So with this question posed, let me conclude by returning to where I began. Making sense of tantric Buddhism is a broadly thought and eminently well-written study that makes its argument patiently and thoroughly. I am so pleased to have read it 
and commend it to all of you. And I should note, uh, it's available electronically through the Regenstein, so you all have access to it. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to uh, first echo uh, some of Jeff's sentiments and remarks, uh, both first in thanking the Dean for having me here um, and giving me the opportunity to talk about this book, to read the book carefully, um, and also to echo, um, I think, um, the sense that uh, uh, this is one of those rare academic books that's as enjoyable and informative and sort of exemplary in its um, working through of its, uh, of its topic, I think for someone who's a little, maybe a little closer to Christian's field than Jeff, but also um, working in a different area. Um, I found this a very, very bracing kind of parallel to certain uh, issues in my own research, in particular questions about um, transgressive or antinomian rhetoric within Buddhism. And so, um, since Jeff has done a good job of uh, sort of giving an overview of the book, and Christian himself has sort of described this sort of middle, that uh, middle way, I would almost say, that he's taken between um, various attempts to understand Tantra and Tantric antinomian discourse. On the one hand, um, uh, in Western scholarship, looking at it as um, this, this bubbling up of this kind of affirmation of life in this primordial um, almost protest against um, monastic restrictions on the one hand, that's one extreme, and on the other hand this kind of degenerative, primitive, um, almost uncivilized thing coming in from the other side. On the other hand, then this kind of medievalist picture uh, model as, as Christian described well. Uh, summarizing that. He didn't talk so much about the next chapter in the book, the going native chapter, which describes indigenous um, Buddhist attempts to um, give their own internal history or mythological history of Tantra. And I want to kind of um, push on that stuff a little bit. But in um, uh, describing this kind of middle way between these extremes, right, on the one hand as a degeneration, on the other hand as a kind of affirmative uh, life affirmative or um, these kind of human nature arguments. I do want to ask, um, well, there's two things. <laughs> One, Christian sort of alluded to this, um, that he's also um, kind of moved beyond another kind of dichotomy that might come up in the scholarship and that was sort of posed as an either or, which is sort of the literal figurative disjunction. In other words, do we read these um, uh, these scriptural commands to um, violate um, uh, accepted norms as something that is to be taken purely figuratively or purely um, literally. And I tend to think um, that there are resources within uh, the semiotics that Christian has described in terms of the total system of text, and that means the total system of Buddhist thought, which make both of those questions, well, make the figurative literalist question irrelevant. And I think he's done a really good job of showing that. I also want to um, push that point. So I actually have two kinds of questions. One is a kind of general question about kind of insider-outsider issues. And those kind of stack up to your two um, uh, um, review chapters, one being the Western scholarship chapter, one being the internal one. It seems to me, um, so I'll start with this general question, and I have one sort of more specific question. And the general question goes like this. Um, it seems to me that when, you, when you've taken this, um, this uh, um, semiotic turn in your interpretive approach, you're actually coming uh, closer to an almost an insider's read, or a sympathetic insider's read of the tradition, which indeed, as you say in the very last lines of the book, allows us to see tantric Buddhism for all its outrageousness as really rather banal. And I wonder if you would agree that um, within the tradition for these professionals who were, were well-versed in the repertoire of elite Buddhist discourse, um, that tantra uh, would not necessarily have seemed as 
um, confusing, outrageous, surprising, as even its own texts tend to represent it. You quote some, some of the tantras that always tell us about exoteric bodhisattvas fainting and being surprised and astonished. Um, commentarial tradition, we often find re-descriptions of those sorts of scenes, which say, actually, this bodhisattva knew the whole story ahead of time. This was kind of play acting for the sake of sentient beings. There's nothing surprising about it, right? They're kind of enacting the position of the reader, bringing the reader into the text, which also means kind of describing a way in which the reader can re-access these, these themes, expecting that non-elite, non-expert reader to react in a certain way. Um, <clears throat> But given the, some, of, I, some of the things that come up, you, you, you go through uh, Skilling's tense points in the conclusion, right? And this is talking about exoteric Mahayana relation to earlier Buddhism. And there we have seemingly a very similar sort of move, right? In other words, what seems to be a radical rejection of a pre-existing set of Buddhist norms, Buddhist doctrines, uh, things taken for granted by Buddhists, um, which are negated, at least ritually negated, or theoretically negated, or, or rhetorically negated, um, but do not seem to have been interpreted, that, that so-called negation is not, was not interpreted as something that an outsider, who was not an expert elite in Buddhism, might take it to be, namely a rejection which means to destroy, abandon, or um, indeed critique those existing forms. So, Given the fact that Buddhism already has within it this um, almost, really banal is a good word, right? Almost this, this accustomed way of self-transcending through negation. And that it has, a, it has um, indigenous resources, and here we might think about things like raft, two truths, upaya, all those types of ideas um, for um, bracketing its own doctrines, seeming to vociferously reject them, critique them, but a kind of critique which is not meant to actually eliminate anything, which in fact <laughs> is a well-worn procedure for building upon uh, and preserving an earlier form. And so if that was already in place in the exoteric Mahayana texts, really how surprising would tantric Buddhism seem. In fact, the position you end up with, again, including the, the sort of non-dualism of figurative and uh, literal, if I can put it that way, um, the neither, this kind of neither nor position, might be exactly how we would expect someone who was very well, one of these elites, to read the tradition. This is kind of a ritual enactment of a set of negations, uh, which is understood in a certain way. And if we are going to go that way, and this is really the, the brunt of the question, um, if we are going to take that much of an insider step, which it seems to me you halfway do, sympathetically in just applying the semiotic approach, um, do we need to or would we benefit from thinking a little more about these forms of negation which are peculiar to Buddhism, peculiar to Buddhist, Buddhist symbolic and doctrinal systems? I'm thinking here of maybe a specific Buddhist form of uh, sublation, you know, uh, that being the, the term we can think of from Western philosophical tradition, from Hegel, Aufheben, um, but not a Hegelian type of sublation, but some other one that, that hews to specific Buddhist soteriological and doctrinal premises. Um, that might be a supplement to the way you've done this here, or even a shortcut back to some of the, the same issues, I'm not sure. So I would like your thoughts on that. Um, the other point I wanted to bring up is a little more specific. And this, this goes um, to um, one of the things that was really fascinating for me in reading your book. Uh, because as I said, I, I deal with this a lot in my own research in East Asia, um, antinomian rhetoric within Buddhism and, and also in other traditions. And one thing I always find useful when doing that is to look at the places where we have explicit uh, transgressions recommended or praised um, and see if there is some implicit thing which is being simultaneously affirmed as inviolable in so doing. In other words, a kind of ultimate and instrumental value distinction. So where one thing is, has become negotiable, now you can do, you can, um, you know, let's say, kill the Buddha. Uh, in, you know, to use the Zen, the Chan and Zen term, um, in the name of what is that done? When one thing is knocked over, when one thing is loosened, what is being solidified in so doing? This is kind of a, 
mini version of my first question in a way. Um, and that, it seems to me this works differently in different types, different places and times in Buddhism, but usually can be a useful question to ask. So when one thing is um, kicked over, where is the person standing or what is being propped up by do doing so? One thing that seems to me in Tantra, and I say this as a non-expert in Tantra, um, but the one place that it always seems to me that no matter what kind of transgression is being um, allowed or praised, the one, uh, that the one place we seem to have a moral dualism, a dichotomy, has to do with the relation not to the Buddha and not to obedience to the Buddha and not to obedience to the tradition, but obedience to the guru the relation to the guru. So it's very easy to understand, for example, how someone could say, yeah, you can uh, you know, destroy the Buddha and eat feces and knock over the temple if your guru tells you to do that, right? Because that would be exemplifying your greater obedience to your guru. It would be a straight, unproblematic, yes, no obedience, right? There's always going to be those kind of stratifications of, of instrumental and ultimate things. So in reading your book, I noticed I was able to find one place where this came up, and I may have missed other ones. This was on uh, page 160. Um, and you have a reference in there to, um, I think, um, not disobeying, but maybe denigrating the guru. But I wanted to ask in general, in terms of the, the sources you were dealing with, how often that comes up, if that is indeed the final frontier of transgression, um, and if we ever get the explicit injunction to um, disobey the guru. And I'll leave my comments at that. Thank you. Thank you both. Christian. Um, yeah, a couple of minutes or two to respond, I guess. Um, uh, it's such a pleasure to have such intelligent people read your book and talk about it. I, I often uh, tell people that one of the best moments of my life uh, as an early academic was my dissertation defense because I had, uh, I think, five people in the room, uh, all of whom were really well, you know, learned, educated, smart people who had read my work and whose job it was to talk to me about it for a couple hours. <laughs> and when else am I going to get that opportunity? <laughs> so in some sense, now is one of those great moments when I actually have people who have read my work who care about it and can ask me good questions. Um, and I was uh, just briefly, I was really gratified to hear uh, what you had to say about uh, biblical traditions and the parallels, and not surprised at all. Um, I mean, one of the uh, kind of themes, I guess, in my own application to my field of study is uh, to give equal attention to the scholarly subject as to the scholarly object. Um, uh, this came up recently, um, uh, one of the... Uh, organizational meetings for the American Religions Workshop and you know, going around, why are you here? It's like, well, I'm a scholar of religions who lives in America. And therefore, the way I think about religion, the way I interact with the data of religion is deeply conditioned by the zeitgeist within, I live, within which I live. And I would be stupid and ignorant and blind to not take seriously what's going on all around me and to the extent that that's conditioning me. I mean, that's a phenomenon that I see all the time in my, the objects of my studies, right? That, that uh, Hindus and Buddhists are living in in the, the same patterned world of ritual, uh, you know, ritual, civic, uh, political space and time, and they begin to absorb uh, things from each other. So uh, there's a tremendous amount to be learned about how we go about our business by looking around and seeing the whole context within which that business is being done. Um, and so I'm not at all surprised to hear that that's going on. Uh, similar uh, ideas. I mean, you can think about the parallelisms between the so-called historical Buddha and the historical Jesus. I mean, these were happening at exactly the same time, <laughs> and the intellectual moves are exactly the same. So that gives us a little bit of a peek behind the curtain or the mirror, or whatever metaphor you want to use, in terms of what, what's driving us and, and to what extent uh, is what we see in our objects determined by the way our subjectivities are being uh, structured. Um, with regard to your concrete question, uh, how would ex exoteric Buddhists respond to the inversions? Um, the best I can say briefly is that the answer to that question has to be historical. Uh, I cannot speculate or, or would be useless for me to speculate what they might do. Um, and we have, in general, as in India, precious little data about that. Um, there are some Tibetan travelers' accounts, uh, for instance, that talk about 
particularly zealous Sri Lankan monks getting upset at um, uh, silver images of tantric deities, uh, Tibetans coming down with um, even uh, Mahayana Pranya Paramita texts, much less, uh, I think in this case it was the Hevadra Tantra, one of these transgressive tantras, and they threw it in the river. Uh, so there was a kind of you know, uh, Sri Lankan thought police uh, that was trying to make sure that, that in Bodh Gaya, this, the central ritual space, everything was, was pure. Right? Um, and even within the tantras, there are some interesting references to um, kind of bad-mouthing people. Uh, the, the word tirtika basically means a kind of heret heretic, somebody who's not a non-Buddhist and is beyond the pale. Um, but you find the term uh, bauda tirtika, right, a Buddhist tirtika showing up uh, of, used of people who reject the tantras, so Buddhists who don't accept uh, those traditions. So th there's certainly some insights we can get into how people are positioning themselves in and, and part of what's interesting about the dynamics of the tradition is, you know, where does the sandal pinch us? Like, how much flexibility is too much flexibility? Um, the Zen and, and Chinese work is really interesting, and, and, and I think, uh, I mean, both of you put your fingers exactly on the key points. Um, in many ways, I could have done the work that I did on this Indian material uh, were it not for the work that had been done on Japanese and Chinese uh, esotericism and on Zen, uh, Bernard Farr's work on, on transgressive rhetoric in, in Zen tradition. Um, and uh, I, I would justify uh, us South Asianists a little bit in the sense that, that I, I'm always uh, uh, really jealous of the access that East Asianists have to realia so that they're actually able to put their texts and, and these, these elite discourses into more concrete contexts, uh, whereas in India we're very much left at sea in that regard. So, so there is an implicit comparative dimension, I think, in which I got to where I was in reconstructing the Indian situation based upon some of the uh, uh, indications, suggestions by people in, in East Asia. Um, the emic edict thing is really interesting, and, and I... Um, I'm very uh, sensitive to that. I, I mean, part of my own intellectual journey was to apply some of these uh, semiotical insights, come to the conclusions I did, publish them, and then stumble upon Buddhist texts that basically give the same readings and think, wow, okay, well, what's going on here, right? Uh, to what extent, you know, am I working against the grain in the tradition? To what extent is my analysis just replicating, you know, indigenous perspectives or not? And like most of these things, I think there's no easy answer. Um, uh, there is, I mean, you're saying how, how big is the critique and is this an accustomed way of self overcoming through negation? It absolutely is, right? I mean, as, as you well know, I mean, Mahayana texts and uh, Vimalakirti and, and all this no, 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 uh, everything that you thought you know is wrong kind of rhetoric is very much part and parcel of, of Mahayana Buddhism. Um, so that's, yeah, maybe not so so special. Um, and finally, uh, yeah, again, another point where you just hit the nail right on the head with the guru, right? You, know, you were talking about where does the limits of transgression go, and I was like, the guru, the guru. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing is that it's not just what the guru tells you to do. Uh, the denigration is key, and that's often where it comes up. So in it, precisely the same passages where it says, you know, kill living beings and tell lies and, and do all the things you're not supposed to do, it says, but if you do anything bad to the initiatory guru, you're going to go to hell for all times. And so, it, and it just stands out like, what is this, right? I mean, it's so in, out of sync with the whole rhetoric of these passages, but it's so consistent. Um, so there's a pretty, uh, you know, obvious, you know, social analysis there in terms of. Um, you know, create, you know, what is the implicit affirmation in the negation? It's of social authority and hierarchy. Um, and if anything, tantric Buddhism being as expensive as it is and as client based, uh, it's entirely uh, comprehensible that it would be as focused as it is upon office and authority and hierarchy. So um, I, I think you got it. <laughs> Well, I hate to cut off a good conversation, but I know that some people have 130 classes, and I want to be sure that everyone here gets a chance to express thanks for this really rich and lively conversation that will continue. So, thank you. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts.
Copyright, University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.